bring forward our uh, next panel now and looking forward to hearing the discussion that they're going to offer. Uh, joined uh, for our next conversation about uh, industry uh, innovation and collaboration uh, within the state of California for a discussion that I think is going to be really good. Uh, joined is now, let's see. Yeah, c come on. Oh, uh, just because you're here. You're here and here. Yep. No, no worries, no worries. <laughs> I like thinking about it. Yes, yes, <laughs> as as is kind of a theme here uh, for with this uh, with this conversation, and so uh, really looking forward to hearing what we're about to hear from our panelists, and uh, so here here we are uh, going to be joined today as as we already have by Karen Ross, the uh, secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Also joined by Walt Duflock, the Vice President of Innovation with Western Growers, uh, Gabe Utzi, the Chief Innovation Officer at uh, the University of California's Agriculture and Natural Resources Division. As, and joining us virtually is Ashley Swearingen with the President and CEO of the Central Valley Community Foundation. And do we, ha do we have Ashley? There she is. We've got her. Good to hear. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> everyone, everyone coordinated their, their blue uh, today. So actually, I'm actually going to, uh, going to go to you first, because one of the things that, uh, that I want to discuss as part of our conversation here is the, is the F3 project and, and Central Valley's role in it. Wondering, um, you know, for folks that might not be, that are in the room watching virtually that might not be familiar, wondering what you can offer by way of perhaps a 60 second elevator speech for the F3 project and and why you believe it's important. You bet. Well, hi, everybody, and apologies for joining virtually, but um, here we are in Fresno slaving away on yet another grant to try to improve economic mobility in our community and in our region, and that's where F3 comes in. Um, and I, I should just qualify my statements real quick and say I feel a little bit awkward being a, a person on a panel at a food and ag summit, and I don't know about food and ag, and so I'm yielding to my colleagues on this panel uh, and their deep expertise, but it is one thing that I do know, and that is community and economic development. And I do know the landscape of the central San Joaquin Valley and the ways in which we've tried to improve innovation and economic development in our region, the ways in which we have tried and failed and the lessons we've learned. And I think the work of the last 25 years, certainly in my experience in doing this kind of work in our region, um, has led us to F3. F3 stands for the future of food innovation in Fresno and Merced. And we've just kind of picked out this, this corridor to show the connection between UC Merced, Fresno State, the 100 mile region that surrounds this five county area. It's not really precise to just Fresno and Merced. Um, but our attempt through F3 is to bring together all of the major components that relate to innovation and actually diversifying our economy in a way that adds quality jobs to the central San Joaquin Valley, but adds those jobs in areas of technology that improves the sustainability of food production. So there's one big component of what we're doing in the innovation realm. There's another big component of what we're doing in the local farm and food innovation world, comments similar to what um, members of your previous panel talked about. And I'll say from my perspective, what we've heard loudly and clearly, that it's not okay to think about innovation in a way that just benefits large farmers, that, um, that small scale farmers have got to be included in front and center when the innovation agenda is set. Uh, and the innovation that is the subject of UC Merced, Fresno State, UC ANR, all of our amazing research scientists, that their focus needs to be on things that benefit both large and small and creating that local food system, local food ecosystem is a big part of F3. So doing those things together. And then lastly, um, focusing on the, the workforce development and the job training that's needed to accomplish the two things that I just mentioned and taking it all the way to the point where we know the jobs that are most at risk of automation as we add this innovation into our farming ecosystem, people whose jobs are most at risk of automation in our view ought to be the ones first in line to receive the training and the upskilling to benefit from the jobs that are coming as a result of the innovation and that local small farm development. So it's all these pieces at once. And uh, if it sounds complicated, um, it's because there are so many pieces, as all of you know, to making these things work. 
Very good. So we Ashley gave us the the overview of what the project is, why she believes it's important. I want to hear the the answer to that second uh, part of that question from you, Secretary Ross. Why the F three project? Why do you think this is an important approach for the future of California agriculture? Well, first we have to recognize what we do so well in the Central Valley, and in particular. Um, we've done it so well, but it has come at expense. It's come at expense of the kinds of jobs that are available. We just talked about that previously. When we think about climate change, it's not only do we have people, and I, I would like to meet the parents who raise their children to be farm workers, we have to be very honest about what the jobs look like that people think they don't want their children to do. And they're going to be doing them outside like we already do, and the more heat extreme events we have, the more that starts to impinge on that. When we have wildfire smoke or all the other things that are going on, we have to think very carefully about all of the ways that the entire workforce will benefit from employers shifting their investments to automation and then focus on the workforce development, the upskilling, just as Ashley said. That is so crucial if we don't think about that at the front end of the designing on these projects, which I've talked to Walt about a lot, we might not have very successful outcomes. So if we want to change the poverty dynamics, if we want to change the outlook for disadvantaged communities that are in our Central Valley, we need to build upon what is already excellent, which is agriculture, but do it in a way that doesn't leave people out. If we don't do this, I'm very fearful about what we will be able to do in this rapidly changing world. And we will miss so many opportunities where we have the most productive systems, we have the most fertile soils, we are smart people who can innovate on water and water conservation. But technology and science are going to drive this. And what Ashley's team has done, and the state of California is a proud partner in this with an investment, is bring all the people together. And if you think it's complicated and hard work, it is. And we're very lucky to have the leader that we have, but also the president of CSU Fresno, the chancellor of UC Merced, private sector groups that have come together that see the promise, the opportunity, and the hope that this is about already building on what has made the state so great with the kind of agricultural systems that we have. When you mentioned bringing all the people together, it doesn't... As I understand it, y'all aren't joking. You're bringing all the people together on this. It, yes, because the, the parts of this, it's always easy to get together with the people that we know, Gabe, Walt, um, the employer community, um, some of the local electeds. But what makes this so unique is it is driven by equity at the center. So it's bringing those small farmers that oftentimes are the hardest to reach and hearing their perspective. It's connecting with community colleges and the community-based organizations that represent the workforce and what their perspective is. And at a time where there's a lot of negativity coming out of the valley because some of these communities have borne a disproportionate environmental impact from our farming systems, these voices have been there. And we thought we were on the right path like two and a half years ago, and then we took an extra year to be much more inclusive of the voices that were involved here. So, Walt, I, I want to bring you into the fold here because uh, we talk about the how, how inclusive this uh, this F3 project is and how inclusive the conversation has been. From the production agriculture standpoint, though, what, what do you view as agriculture's role in all of this, specifically the, the producer's role in this conversation? Sure. I think it's really two roles. I think, number one, we need to invent some of the cool technology and get it scaled, and that is a massive lift, right? So building all the harvest, weeding, thinning robots we've seen over the last 20 years, um, helping them get fundraising because uh, they need massive amounts of capital to scale. Uh, that's part of it. The production ag side then needs to get those, those thesis and machines validated. Are they working? Are they working at the right economics? We've seen a lot of robots that work, but it's not two cents an apple, it's two dollars an apple. That's a problem, right? Um, and so I think, I think the job of the ag community is find the next set of innovators, get them from a research stage to commercialization, and then we realized it's, it's not that the robots are gonna take all the jobs. In fact, they're gonna enable higher skilled, higher paying, hard to find, hard to keep jobs. If you look at thinning, for example, you replace a 25 person thinning crew with a thinning robot, but it's not a, it's not a full swap. 
You then need a crew of about three, if you talk to most of our growers, that have to look after the robot, take care of the robot, understand the robot and its dynamics with the soil and the operation, and how they can optimize all of that. So there's both a build component and there's a training component. And, and working with Secretary Ross and her team, we've got a grant out there with Carrie Peterson in tow to, to train 3,000 peoples on these new ag tech solutions because if we don't train them, where are they gonna come from? So it's both a get the robots ready and into the fields and get that next gen generation of ag workers ready and out into the fields, hopefully at about the same time. Well, and, and Gabe, we, we, we talk about the production ag role in this, but uh, there's also a big component uh, at the college system, the community college system, a very substantial educational component to, to this project. What can you tell us about that and what you think the, the hurdles that need to be cleared for optimal success here? Yeah, <clears throat> there's been a lot of great discussion about workforce development. And at the University of California, we do workforce development, we do research and t technology development. And we also, uh, through roles like mine, we actually work on how do we translate that research into practical, on the ground um, technologies that, that our producers can use. Um, so I think what we've realized is that ag tech is gonna require a hugely interdisciplinary um, uh, set of skills and, and uh, people, so people from computer science, plant science, food science, um, environmental science, climate technologies. And so we're increasingly finding ways to bring them together into uh, completely new formats. We have a new, at, at, as one example at UC Davis, we've got an artificial intelligence and next generation food systems group that brings like really different types of people together. Not only did we realize that we, we have to bring the researchers together, but we also have to bring uh, community colleges and, and high school students. We actually have workforce development programs where we're actually training high school teachers on how to teach ag tech at very early high school levels. Um, bring community college students into career exploration fellowships across the state of California. And so I think we're realizing uh, from the University of California we have to be really interdisciplinary, uh, but also to bring um, many, many different types of students with different skill sets and career aspirations together uh, to really advance the technology forward. Because as, as we, we talk about F3, we're not just trying to create a new set of technologies, we're trying to create a, a brand new industry industry, ag tech industry with leadership from the Central Valley. And so that, that is going to take a, a whole range of different um, disciplines and technologies and training programs and us all working together on it um, if we're going to rival something of size and importance of Silicon Valley to ag and ag tech. And Spencer, this will make ag sexy. And this is what we need if we want to have workers of the future. Sorry, tell Jack that I'm carrying through from the February session we did down in Imperial County, OK? <laughs> Well, I, I didn't know that particular terminology was coming up, but we can roll with it here. Come on, think of that. Yeah, <laughs> but so uh, I, I suppose before we, you know, while, while we're specifically talking about F three, and before we get to, to innovation more broadly, actually uh, wondering, I, I understand that there's a there's an application process with the federal government. Wondering the latest that you can offer our audience in terms of where that process stands and and what you all are are anticipating in terms of uh, timelines for news and things of that nature. Sure, yeah, we, uh, thanks to support from the state, uh, we've had some matching funds that we're now trying to leverage with um, this big grant competition that the Economic Development Administration is administering. It's called the Regional Challenge Grant. And our case to the federal government is that food and ag technology absolutely needs to be a priority for the nation. And therefore, a proposal coming forward that is dedicating resources to the development of sustainable food production has to be front, uh, front and center for the federal government. And if there is going to be a food proposal, which we believe there should be, it needs to be from California and it needs to be from California Central Valley. So that's our proposal. It's a $100 million request to the federal government to fund those three big pieces, innovation, local farm and food innovation and food systems and workforce all together, pulling all of these pieces together in a comprehensive way. Um, we've heard recently that uh, announcements are coming in the next few weeks, maybe in the next month, and we're cautiously optimistic that, um, that folks in D.C. are hearing our appeal about the importance of, uh, of this industry and the people in the communities in the Central Valley who do, who do pay a price to make sure that there's quality, affordable food, produce, especially on the tables of virtually every American household. You know, that's happening in the Central Valley, and we think that 
you know, the region that feeds the nation needs to be the nation's priority. And uh, we're, ca we're cautiously optimistic we're going to be included as a finalist. I'm not sure if we'll get the full funding, um, but, uh, but I feel good about it right now. Very good. Well, I appreciate the, some of the specifics on, on F3, and as we continue our conversation, hopefully we'll be able to touch on some more uh, aspects of that. But I want to sort of zoom the conversation out a little bit and talk uh, specifically or more generally about innovation in, in general and, and how the industry and, and the state of California can, can take that approach. And, and Walt, one of, the, one of the things that you had mentioned in, in a preparatory call for this panel was that there are other states that are kind of leading the way on automation because they're choosing to. Uh, you're, do you... Your thoughts on California's approach to automation and any potential concerns you might have about it? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting field, and I heard automation coming up earlier today, which was great. I think automation is one of those ecosystem discussions, right? So you've got all this technology to enable autonomous. You've got a lot of that in Silicon Valley, where I'm from, and a lot of it in, in uh, implemented in Salinas Valley, where I, where I have a ranch uh, for, for a couple generations as a family ranch. And, and so autonomy can help people driving on freeways. Autonomy can help people driving on you know, tractors on, on farms. And what's interesting is I went down and had a meeting in Arizona. Arizona and California have been duking it out for autonomy for a few years now. Um, and Arizona very clearly understands that they're winning because of policy decisions they've chosen to make. And so when I went down there to talk to their, to their Department of Transportation in Phoenix, they basically asked, they said, well, what is it that we can do to, to maintain a leadership position. And I said, well, as a, as a you know, Californian born and raised, um, I can say I hope that we can catch up. But, but as someone who's visiting Phoenix on behalf of Western Growers, I can say, um, do exactly what you're doing. Make the decisions you're making, support the policies that enable this autonomous driving to happen on roads and on fields, and, and we'll get there faster. Um, so I think, it's a live battle. Uh, Arizona and California are at the front of it. I think California will continue to lead in a lot of autonomous technologies. I think Arizona will continue to lead for the foreseeable future in terms of implementing those technologies on roads and on farms. And it's really up to California to make the decision from here. Arizona is throwing the gauntlet down and saying, we're leading until somebody comes and gets us. California, as, as was early, earlier mentioned, they made a big decision not to change the rules around autonomous driving a couple weeks ago. And you can argue why they did that, but they did that. And so as it is now, you need a variance to operate autonomous vehicles in California. And that is going to slow progress down on the implementation side in California. And my history with technology, 30 years in Silicon Valley now, and a lot of watching of farm tech, is wherever the implementation happens, that's where the ecosystem tends to be around it. So that's helped Silicon Valley with things like Facebook and Apple and others. Um, it's not helping us right now in autonomous. So this isn't a situation where you think the lessons learned in Arizona could help the farmer in California. You think, you think the California farmer will remain behind as a result of sort of the lagging implementation? I think the California ag tech ecosystem will lag behind. I think the farmers will do just fine. I think uh, technology that's implemented in Arizona can easily come up the state to California and other places. I think the ecosystem that supports it is likely to be closer to Phoenix than it is to Silicon Valley at the moment. That can change, but at the moment, if I were predicting and a, if I were a betting individual, I would say Phoenix is in a good spot and they know they're in a good spot. It's not, it's not by accident. Secretary Aras, you were looking to get in there. So um, just to follow up on a couple of other panels today, this is a space where it's really important to understand how we get through permitting processes that can really help us get the outcomes we want so that you're trying to reward what you do want to see out there as opposed to creating more barriers. And that requires innovation in government, which I work for a boss right now who's all about trying to innovate and look at things differently and bringing all the voices together at the front of the process. I have done some digging into the decision that was made a couple weeks ago. Um, there's a number of nuances in that and I think quite truthfully, Sitting down, there's two parties that you need to sit down with at the beginning when you're designing this. One is the workforce. Who are you going to bring to the table for the labor and the workforce people so that if they have concerns about what does this mean for my health and safety because they simply don't know about it, they've had a voice in that upfront design and talk to the regulators about the best pathway for regulatory permitting and where there are opportunities to try to accelerate that without sacrificing. We have to recognize California has very strong environmental protections and very strong labor protections and trying to find ways to collaborate with labor 
or the voices of labor and those who will be in the fields with this is going to be very important. Well, and as we look at just sort of the, the broader subject of automation, Gabe, I want to bring you in here because how, how do the nations and, and specifically California's educational entities go about training students to prepare for innovations that are not currently in existence? How, how do you go about that process to develop a workforce that knows that's going to have to adapt in its career several times over to new technologies that are not currently able to be educated upon? Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the key struggles that, that educational institutions around the state and around the country are grappling with related to ag tech. So I think it starts with some uh, interdisciplinary work, you know, uh, like the summer we, we ran a uh, artificial intelligence for, for plant scientists uh, uh, people. So, so we, in our community colleges, um, there's now integrated computer science and ag programs. And, and so I think there's a lot of cross-disciplinary training that's starting to happen along with very, very practical, hands-on um, uh, field work in the field today, um, where it's training existing farm workers to actually run and work with robotics and capture data. Um, so I think it's a really, uh, you know, a building an airplane as we're flying it scenario. Um, but I think that uh, there's a very iterative process happening where there's programs starting to come together from very uh, odd bedfellows, you know, in technology and engineering and plant science and food science disciplines um, at really every level. And uh, at, at the same time, I think we're also, like I mentioned, we're trying to really get really down to the high school, even junior high levels to get kids involved and exposed to these new technologies, even if it's flying a little drone um, in an agricultural context. I mean, that opens up students' uh, thinking and, and world of, of possibilities. Or working in a community garden, I mean, just so they're exposed to agriculture. So I, I see more and more of those kinds of activities. We don't know where all of the technology is going to go yet, but I, but I see a lot more of those, um, those things being developed in very non-traditional places as a way to begin. What are you seeing? You know, you mentioned some of your student level outreach, you know, high school, even into junior high. What are you seeing in terms of student interest once that they are exposed to that technology? Are, are um, you getting are you getting more ag, you know, tech majors in, into your college yeah, systems? Absolutely. So I think I, I know it. A number of the UCs, um, we have really off the charts um, interest in a lot of our plant sciences and food sciences careers. I, I, I personally see a lot of students that, uh, or, or young professionals that want to come from, like say, a Silicon Valley technology context to do something meaningful, whether it's fight climate change or feed the world or um, bring equity. And so I see, I see a lot of, of, anecdotally, a lot of those things happening. Um, I also, I think we see once kids are exposed to these new careers of the future, even if they don't have a full understanding of all the various possibilities, they get like extremely excited and in, in some cases it has absolutely changed career directions. And so I think the more we can expose the kids to new technologies, new careers, new possibilities, like Karen said, making ag sexy again, it really actually does work. And the earlier you expose kids to that, the more they start to, to pick those trajectories that lead to these uh, careers of the future. So a question for whoever would like to take it, you know, he, when, uh, when Gabe was talking, he mentioned we do see that interest of folks maybe considering a Silicon Valley career but want to do something more meaningful with it. How do you take that leverage, or how do you take that interest and maybe leverage it into action, into positive outcomes for the agriculture industry? I'll go. Um, I would say do more of what we've been able to do with the Next Gen Ag Worker Program. So we had four events, right? Reedley, Imperial, Hartnell, and Woodland. And Karen was nice enough to join us at all of them. And, and what we did on a couple of those with day two, and we couldn't do it at all four, and that's, that's a miss on our part um, that we're gonna, we're gonna fix for the next set of four. But what we did at a couple of those, just to test it out, was we actually put the robots and the technology in the fields. And on day two, after a half day of, of panels like this, and a great dinner with some, with some nice friends to have discussions with. The next morning we rolled out to the fields and nothing got the kids more excited and even Karen's fireside chat and my panel, <laughs> don't get them as excited as going out and seeing some of the robots. So seeing a farm wise robot yeah. in the field, seeing yeah. a stout robot in the field, seeing some of these robots in the field, they are, they are rapt attention. 
I can't think of anything that would get the average 16, 17, 18 year old FFA student or not more interested than actually interacting with both the technology and the people that built it. And that's what they get a chance to do. So I would argue the more in-field things you can do, the better. And where I see that happening, starting to happen at scale is you see startups like Milano Technical Group supporting these up in Merced. You see um, Future, Future Acres and Suma Reddy and her team doing it down in um, Reedley in LA and just getting them in the dirt with the tractors, with the robots where they can ask questions and out of a classroom environment, that's a huge win. And last I checked, most kids have about 10 weeks open in summer, so there, there's yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. No substitute for dirty hands. Secretary Ross, you look like no, you were trying to get in No, there. I was just gonna say, um, Ashley's done a great job of connecting with community colleges, and that's an important place. But also, this is really long-term, but what we've heard from a lot of Silicon Valley people is the earlier you introduce this, children cannot aspire to something they've never seen. Right they've never been exposed to. So I feel that this might sound off topic, but it isn't. What we've done, I've partnered with the first partner and we brought together about 100 people on our farm to school roadmap for success. Mm -hmm. It has three elements to it. One is improving the nutritional aspect of what we're offering to kids and make it flavorful and attractive so they'll do it. And it has nutrition education in the cafeteria and in the classroom. It is about supporting local procurement as a pathway for small and mid-sized growers who may not find a fit for themselves in export markets, but it's really becoming important as part of the local economy. And three is experiential learning, where these students, if they grow it in the garden, if they're helping to prepare it, if they can go out and meet a farmer and be on the farm from very young ages, they, that's an experience that they might not end up in ag, but I think it's a pathway to career development that we should not dismiss. I just want to add, just to second the idea that these short, these things outside of degree programs and, and events, competitions um, of all different kinds, whether it's, you know, pro hacking a drone or whether it's, uh, you know, creating a software application. We're going to do a demo day as part of an ag robotics event that uh, F3 is sponsoring in Fresno in October. So, so the more we can make space in every activity that we do for young people to participate, whether they're elementary school kids or graduate students or anything in between, that is what we need to be doing at every single event, including events like this one, so that kids can participate and start to capture the vision of how they can participate in the, the development of this future. Very good. Uh, Ashley, we haven't forgot about you, I promise. Uh, I got a, got a question submitted on uh, Slido for you, and I would encourage all of you as you're uh, continuing to uh, watch this panel and you'd like to participate, by all means, submit a question for our panel. Uh, but one was submitted for you, Ashley, and it says, as someone who was not originally involved in agriculture, uh, what have you learned about ag being an economic driver for certain communities like the Central Valley? So much. Um, and... Um, it's been interesting to be in community and economic development for almost 25 years now in this powerhouse, you know, food producing region. I've been around, around all these conversations for so long and yet don't have direct industry experience. And I would just say like sort of high level describing my 20 plus years of direct, you know, of, of, of trying to figure out where are the tension points and where are the releases for the win-win for the economy, the environment, people. Um, y'all, y'all live in a pretty contentious world. Like it's a very, like, there's a lot of conflict. I, I, I only in the like recent months would say, I feel like there's this opening where, um, all sides of this multifaceted dynamic have a chance at maybe just maybe leaning in and unlocking some of these long standing points of conflict. And so, um, I'm hopeful um, and what it really has taken, I think Secretary Ross, you, you pointed out early on, like what it has really taken is, I think, I feel like all sides fighting as hard as they can to overpower and eliminate their opponent. You know, like that, like it's human nature. The first thing we're gonna try to do is just win, right? And, and like beat the other guy or gal and beat the part of society that we think is detrimental for whatever the reason is. And we've gone at it. I mean, it is swords crossing, maximum intense, like uh, lawsuits, you know, political firestorms, et cetera. And in, in my just little outside, slight outside observer here, I feel like 
the various components of the overall industry and ecosystem are tired of that fight. Even people who I'm quite sure folks in the room are thinking like, oh, no, no, so-and-so has the upper hand or XYZ stakeholder group has the upper hand. They're winning in the courts or they're winning in the regulatory environment. They're winning in DC or whatever. I don't know anybody in this dynamic that thinks they're actually winning and getting the outcomes they say they want. Even if they're winning the lawsuit, they're like those who have maybe gone against industry for a long time are realizing like, whoa, we might get this regulatory win, but it doesn't actually change things enough. It's not changing the planet enough. It's not creating enough economic opportunity for people. So everybody's feeling like they're losers and enter a global pandemic and enter conversation, concern, like near panic around food supply enter a war in Europe. That's where we're at right now. We've got, we've got some opportunities. We, we've got some opportunities that I haven't observed us having from a regional perspective. And it's really coming down to this. Nobody's getting what they want. People are realizing we actually have to do food at scale and we've got to do it in a regenerative way because we do kind of care about not just 100 years from now, but like 10 years from now. And we're at the brink of having pretty um, catastrophic outcomes in the field if we don't start to take, if we don't do more, dig deeper and do more. Um, and our communities are dying from a job standpoint. Our communities are dying. It's not sustainable, our, our status quo. So all of that doomsday talk is to say, like, maybe, maybe there's a new path here. And I've, I have seen, I've heard some people sitting and talking to one another who have been almost mortal enemies in recent years. And that seems to be shifting that there's some respect. There's some like, okay, like, yeah, you beat me in that lawsuit. I don't agree with your point of view. I'm seeking understanding. I may not agree, but I'm seeking understanding on your point of view. And I'm seeing that from multiple, multiple sectors. So I know that can come off a little bit idealistic. But oh, darn. Such a great speech. Yes. I was she got just zoomed. Going to, I was just going to say, I think there was an early breakthrough. So many people study this. And, um, and it comes down to collaboration. It comes down to people who are competing also sitting and talking and sharing. And like, like this whole thing is not just nonprofit pie in the sky. Although certainly we serve up our fair, you know, slice of that pie in the nonprofit world. But the fact of the matter is collaboration talking to people you don't like, leveraging resources, that, that, that is secret stuff, sauce kind of stuff in Silicon Valley. So I think applying it to food and ag tech and, you know, and the, the, the real severe resource constraints that we have in the Central Valley, maybe, maybe just maybe we get a breakthrough this time. You know, I mean, and by the way, what else are we going to do? But keep trying. We've got we've to figure this out. I just wanted to say, I think an early... Um forecast of bringing people together was around drinking water, be what, five years ago now. And uh, to huge kudos, um, Gail with Western Growers, Emily with Ag Council. People sat around the table to try to figure this out because we knew that it was critical to all of our communities. And we actually came up with solutions. In fact, the ag community came up with, we'll put a tax on ourselves to put money into a fund and the legislature chose a different pathway. But I think doing that helped build some goodwill. Collaboration is hard and messy and tedious. And you have to focus on some small wins to build the trust to take on the really big issues. And I really think that really helps set the table for the kind of work that Ashley's been doing on a daily basis around economic development. Ashley, another question was uh, was submitted for you, and you talked kind of at the end of your response there about some things that Silicon Valley is doing that uh, perhaps the Central Valley could, could learn from a little bit. But the question that was submitted actually posed uh, to wonder, what can the Central Valley teach Silicon Valley? <laughs> um, a lot. Um, first of all, like what it is actually like to live on the planet, you know, and not live in <laughs> um, just some... Um, like bubble, uh, whatever. No, I, I feel like. I don't know if you can I, I hear the like, round of applause that you just got, <laughs> Ashley, but. Uh. I, oh, good. Well, um, I feel like not only can Silicon Valley benefit from the Central Valley, like all of California just needs a dose of the Central Valley. You know, there, there is something powerful and kinetic and connecting um, 
across the board when when you are in communities and working with people who every day touch touch the earth i mean that like that's that that is something very powerful it is it is literal and it is figurative um so i feel like silicon valley can learn from the central valley how to do more with less hello um like kind of how to get over yourself a little bit maybe can i say that um uh, I, I think there's a there's a lot of just gr groundedness and humility in the Central Valley, and and I really do believe that people around the state um, can can benefit from what we contribute, and not just the fresh fruits and vegetables and the quality food, but the the outlook, the approach, um, you know, the connection to people and to place. I want to little, add a little something about this. I think it's important to think about what Silicon. Why hasn't Silicon Valley solved our ag tech problem yet? I mean. It's a good question, right? And I think they've, they've realized that growing food and the, the science of it, the business of it, is way, way, way more complex than anything they're building or engineering in, in software or, or devices. So um, <clears throat> I think they, they've learned a little humility, actually, by coming and, and the companies that have been successful in ag tech that have come from Silicon Valley have spent time here and have spent time with the, with the growers, with the scientists, and realize there actually is a, is a lot to learn, and so there's far more variables to human biological, you know, biological plant systems than these other systems. So I, I think that um, that's been one realization, and the, that's in part why all these new disciplines coming together um, is what's needed to actually solve the problem and get the technology working. I, and I'll just add to that, Gabe, that's such a great point. Um, as a person who's been on the economic development side, and for sure when I was at the city of Fresno, um, played host a lot to Silicon Valley inventors, investors, and you know, obviously we were always trying to open the, the, you know, the front door and, and help connect our region to economic opportunity investment from other parts of the region. And so often what we experienced was that um, somebody had a great idea, some you know application of technology that they anticipated could work in a, you know in a production ag setting, and the technology and innovation was happening way outside the Central Valley, um, and sort of things get invented in the Silicon Valley, and then people would show up and be like, "Ta-da! Here is your new device, or here is your new application." Time after time, and they're like that never works. Yeah. It never works, and so. One of the big pushes that we've made with this F3 grant, for example, is no, no, we want the innovation assets directly headquartered in the place where the people who are gonna use the devices actually live and work. And so kind of marrying up this innovation in, in place at the same time, I think this is another key attribute of like, how do we actually get breakthrough this time? It's like farmers, small farmers, farm workers, they are the ones who should be setting the agenda for innovation and technology development. And then by the way, when that when it's time to manufacture those new devices and get to scale with these um, with this innovation, if that is manufactured outside of the U.S., like literally over my dead body, you know, and like and by the way, it really should be in the Central Valley. So you know, the key to diversifying our economy is making stuff ourselves in our own region. And people who, you know, may, maybe jobs are transitioning and maybe you need fewer people on farm, but those, the, those same folks can be a part of manufacturing new devices and equipment that's used on farm and, and potentially even earn more money doing so. So this all creates this sort of virtuous cycle, but it starts with getting the resources directly into the place and into the hands of the people that are, that are doing the growing. And I would just add on, I think both valleys learn from each other. Um, look at a lot of startups every year in ag tech. And I think there are two characteristics of the ones in automation that have the highest degree, highest, highest chance of success, because it's a startup, right? The, the, a lot of them blow up. Uh, but if you look at the two characteristics of those that, that look to do well and can fundraise, number one, they've got somebody, probably a founder, if not a very early lead, who has boots on the ground experience, right? They either grew up in the dirt or they grew up close to the dirt, they've spent time in the dirt, um, and then the second thing is that's starting to happen is Silicon Valley gets involved later, right? So after that in the, in the dirt group gets started and can bootstrap it and can put a few hundred thousand dollars of friends and family money into play and builds the first version of the robot, then you bring Silicon Valley because they do know how to scale. So Gabe's exactly right. It's really hard to do version 1.0 of a robot. And then once you have 1.0, it's really hard to scale it. Both are hard and both need different skill sets. So I think our job as an ag tech ecosystem is 
work with the universities to get both of those skill sets in play. Wouldn't it be great if every founding team for a startup had an ag guy or gal, a business guy or gal, and a technology guy or gal, someone to run product and someone to run ag, that way you'd have a higher chance of success at the fundraising level because the investors could pattern recognize a little better. And you'd probably have a better su success chance with the farmer because they'd realize, oh, this person does have boots on the ground experience. So I think getting those two groups that don't necessarily play together all the time together at the university level before they even leave school is one of the big ideas. Um, and that can start at the you know, freshman, sophomore year in college. Very good. Well, folks, we're, uh, we've got about uh, three or four minutes left here, and so I'll just ask a question to, to all of you to conclude things. Wondering, same question for all of you, what do you assess, and I'll start with you here, Walt, what do you assess as the ag industry's biggest need to grease the wheels of innovation? What is the, the one thing that you think, if it were accomplished, would be the most beneficial to agricultural, agricultural innovation, be it F3 or otherwise? Cash. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. Um, <laughs> it is the truth. The truth is there are a lot of attractive segments in ag tech. Biologicals, alternative proteins tend to get a lot of capital the last couple years. Um, software, digital analytics, things you can scale with, with keyboard, not with hammer. And the reality is in the case of weeding, thinning, machines where you can work on multiple crops with one robot, one, one device, you can get to scale a little bit better. But for harvest specifically, and that is where so often half of the labor equation falls, for harvest specifically, it looks like until we, we get proven otherwise, one robot is needed per one specialty crop. And there are hundreds of specialty crops. So we're gonna need capital. Now, we need to help the startups reduce their capital needs by building some Lego blocks and some toolkits for them. We're doing that at Western Growers with our partners. But fundamentally, we're gonna need 25 to $50 million per harvest robot, and that's gonna need to come from grants and other places and support from other, other industries because the venture capital numbers came out for the last quarter, and ag tech was down by a decent amount, and robots were down by a more than decent amount. So I think the investor community is lukewarm right now on some of the harvest robot space. So we need capital and great teams. Secretary Ross? It's, it's hard to beat that, but it comes down to um, faith in the ag community that it knows what it's talking about, that it's not a dead end place. And I think the whole global discussion about food security is so important right now. We need to have investors see the opportunities. There are unbelievable opportunities here to not only do something that economically makes sense, but will be part of the solution to climate change and can create good jobs and, and help us get out of poverty. If you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you could look at a list of those 20-some goals, and over half of them have an ag nexus. And we don't have enough faith that ag is it has been part of our history and it's critical to our future and so i just would like to find a way of instilling that kind of faith and belief and understanding where the partnerships are to help make it happen we can't afford to have investors walk away from it yeah i, I building on both what you both have said i think that um, we really need a recognition that our food producers are really the solution to helping address climate change and, and partnering with them um, is, is, is going to create amazing new solutions for climate change, for water security, and really ultimately viewing food, California's um, food security as national security. I think, you know, we are the nation's fresh food production system and viewing it as an indispensable asset to the entire nation and the world, I think is, is really what we need more of. And we need more people viewing it that way, advocating for it that way, and really the partnership across the, the various aisles we have here in California uh, to not see agriculture and food as the bad guy in California, but really as an opportunity to create amazing new environmental solutions that will help address climate change and produce our nation's um, food supply. Ashley, bring us home. What's the, the one thing that you think would uh, best uh, grease the wheels of ag innovation? Okay, I'm just gonna summarize. We've heard cash and teams. We've heard seeing ag as part of the future and having faith in the institution and ag. We've seen, or we've heard Gabe say recognition 
that food producers are part of climate change and it is national security. So I'm gonna say yes and amen to that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say water as well. And then I'm gonna land on collaboration because we won't see a breakthrough in these items that were, that were just mentioned if we're not willing to sit down and hear hard things, hard conversations, keep working together and finding the win-win. That's ultimately what it's gonna take. Y'all, this is fun. Please join me in thanking our panel.